Welcome to the opening game of the Midwinter Minis Warhammer 40,000 Start Collecting Deathmatch series. 16 Start Collecting boxes covering all the main factions in Warhammer 40k will go head to head in a classic single elimination tournament. Not only will we find out which Start Collecting box is the strongest, we'll get to see pretty much all the factions in 40k duke it out, so you can get an idea of how the armies play in small competitive games. In total, there will be 15 matches, so there'll be plenty of fun games to keep you entertained over the months ahead. Each of the 16 armies will be represented using only their most recent Start Collecting box and using the most up-to-date codex and rules that are available at the time of recording each battle. Now, just to give you a quick update from behind the scenes here, we'd planned this series out before COVID struck earlier this year, which obviously threw a spanner in the works. Essex, the county in the UK where Midwinter Minis is based, has just gone into another pretty strict lockdown and households aren't allowed to mix indoors. So there might be a small delay in filming new episodes. The original plan was to put out one every fortnight, but we'll do our best to make at least one a month, even if we have to do them remotely. All right, let me quickly set out the scenario for the tournament and introduce you to the deathmatch arena. Penny and I have custom built this enclosed arena, which will play host to all 15 games. To keep things fair, balanced, and easy to follow, the deployment zones and objective scoring zones are clearly marked out, and the board is symmetrical. Instead of having a 40mm objective and measuring the distance from it, we've made it nice and obvious with white lines. And just to be clear, the scoring zone is within the inside of the white circle, and not on the outside edge. The zone mortalis walls are just for blocking line of sight, and they can be scaled but offer no defensive bonus if models are on top. They do offer some nice cover for models wanting to maneuver around the arena though. As the vast majority of the start collecting armies are below 500 points, the size of the arena floor is exactly the combat patrol size of 44 inches by 30 inches. Even though a couple of the armies in this tournament do tip the scales over 500 points, all armies will be limited to three command points at the start of the game. The scenario for every battle is a slightly simplified custom version of Eternal War. The game lasts four turns, and the battlefield has three scoring zones, each worth five victory points if held uncontested in your command phase, starting from turn two. Each player can select one secondary objective, basically for tiebreaker purposes. If the scores are still tied at the end of turn four, the battle will go on for one more turn. So long as they're ahead on points at the end of turn four, armies can still be victorious even if they have been completely destroyed. Nice and simple. Now, let's check out the armies in this glorious opening game of Orcs versus Corn Demons. To introduce you to the Start Collecting Corn Demons army, I'll hand you over to our very special guest. Mini Wargamer Dave here from MiniWarGaming.com. I'm super excited today to be facing off against Guy in this first Start Collecting Deathmatch, and I'll be taking control of the Corn Demons. Some quick notes on how Corn Demons play. They are melee focused, they don't have shooting, they got a 5 plus in vulnerable save, and they want to get into close combat as fast as possible. The Start Collecting box has a Blood Throne as an HQ choice, which is an absolute monster in the fight phase. Now, if you didn't want the Blood Throne, you also have the option to build him as a Skull Cannon. However, in order to create a Battleforge detachment, we needed to make it a Blood Throne so that he can become an HQ and a warlord. Speaking of which, his warlord trait is immense power, which buff units within six inches of him. For my troops choice, I have blood letters, which are very effective in close combat. They're equipped with a demonic icon to hopefully bring back demons that flee, and I've got an instrument of chaos on them to make my charges just a little bit more effective on these guys. In the elite slot, I have blood crushers. They're fast, they're furious, they are devastating up close. They also have an icon and an instrument as well. However, they're only toughness four, so they're a bit of a glass cannon. The nice thing about this star collecting box is that there aren't too many war gear choices, so you won't have to worry too much about what weapons to choose. I'm going to select cut off the head as a secondary objective. Before the battle begins, I'll be spending one of my command points on a stratagem called Banner of Blood. I can only use this once per battle, but when I do, I select a unit with an icon, and when that unit goes to charge, instead of rolling the regular 2d6 inches, I'll be rolling 3d6 inches. Now obviously Dave's in Canada, 
we're in the UK, so we're playing this game over a video call, and my girlfriend Penny is going to be Dave's avatar. Hello! Moving his models and rolling his dice. And apologising for the inevitable terrible rolling. Okay, now let's check out the Orc Start Collecting box. Inside you'll find a squad of 10 boys, the standard foot slogging troops of the Orc army. Pretty strong, pretty tough and very vicious. But they've only got a 6 plus armour save, so they're quite vulnerable. I've built them as shooter boys, which makes them a bit better at running and gunning, and I've also given one of them a big shooter special weapon for some extra dacker. There's also a squad of 5 knobs, bigger, tougher orcs who really rip stuff up in close combat. I've given them slugger pistols and big choppers. They also have a little ammo runt with them to help save some missed shots. There's a big war machine, the Death Dread, which is actually one of the most lethal units in this whole tournament. I've built this one with three Dread Claws to mince things up in close combat, and a Scorcher, which I think is going to be very useful in this small arena. There's also a Pain Boy, pretty tasty in close combat with his Power Claw, but he can also help bring dead and injured boys back to life, which is very handy. The funny thing is, even though this guy kind of looks like the boss in the start collecting box, he isn't an HQ choice. So to fill that space in the roster using the models in the box, I use the knob that comes with the boy squad. Outfitted him with a power claw and a bodged together custom shooter, and we're going to call him our war boss. With the inclusion of the war boss, we've now got a Battleforge patrol detachment, so we have three command points to play with and generate an extra one in each command phase. I'm going to use a command point before the game begins to make this war boss the biggest boss, which makes him a bit more vicious and gives him a pretty decent 4 plus invulnerable save. My orcs are Death Skulls, the luckiest orc clan, and the Death Skulls special rule gives me an army wide 6 plus invulnerable save and lets me re roll a single failed hit wound and damage roll each time any unit shoots or fights. Now for my secondary objective, I do fancy my chances of tearing that blood throne up, so I'm also going to go with cut off the head. The sooner that blood throne dies, the more points I'll get. Ok, that covers the teams, let's get to it. We rolled off to see who goes first, and with a 6, Orcs are going first. Orcs turn 1, here we go. At the start of the turn, in the command phase, I get an additional command point, bringing my total command points to 3. Onto the movement phase, I'm going to be advancing all of my infantry up as far as possible to get into the fight as soon as possible. I'm also going to be advancing my Death Dread because he's totally out of range anyway, with a Scorcher only having a short range. After some pretty good advance rolling, I'm now in two of the objectives, holding one with my Pain Boy and holding the other, for now, with my Death Dread. Moving on to the shooting phase, I've only got 5 of my boys in range with their shooters, but they'll be doing 2 shots each, and because they advance they'll be a minus 1 to hit, meaning only 6s will make their mark. Targeting the blood letters, after my death skulls reroll and daka 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 extra shots, I hit 4 times. Strength 4 against toughness 3 means I only need 3s to wound, and I roll 3, even after my death skulls reroll. Only one of those 5 plus invulnerable demon saves makes it, so two demons are removed. The squad of boys also has a big shooter which is in range, hitting on sixes. Absolutely nothing. Finally, the war boss's custom shooter will be hitting on sixes as well, targeting the blood letters. And again, zero hits. And that marks the end of a pretty uneventful shooting phase, and no one is within charge range, so on to corn demons, turn one going from 2 to 3 command points at the beginning of the command phase. Guy is on two objectives. I don't like this very much, and I don't think Korn likes it either. So I'm moving forward, my blood letters, they're 6 inches. Next up, moving the blood crushers on the side, looking at that juicy death dread. And lastly, moving the blood throne, just to support the blood letters a little bit. Got no shooting in my army. On to the charge phase. First I'm going to charge in the blood letters. I've already spent the command point on the banner of blood before the game, so they'll be rolling their 3d6, plus one because of their instrument for the charge. And they easily make the charge because Korn wants it this day of reckoning. Now onto the blood crushers, charging into that death dread. I'm going to interrupt this little charge and use a command point to overwatch against these blood crushers with my death dreads scorcher. d6 automatic hits and I roll a 3, mm, I'll take that. So wounding on 3's with my death skulls reroll 
and all of them go through. Rolling our four-up save on the blood crushers and making all of them. Corn lives in the fire. Rolling 2d6 to charge, adding one to this because of their instrument of chaos. And they were one inch short, unfortunately. But you know what? I'm gonna spend a command point to reroll that because I think Corn really wants to get into combat this round. And we make it with an eight plus one more for the instrument of chaos, bringing it up to nine, which is exactly what we needed. And looking at that blood throne back there, it would be a better strategy to stay back on the objective so that I can get some victory points. However, we are playing corn today and I really wanna go in there. So the blood throne is gonna charge that death dread. Oh! <laughs> and we needed nine inches, unfortunately. That is a fail. Not this round for him. He is very sadly holding the objective like he should be. I'm gonna go first with the Blood Crushers because Guy's Death Dread does three damage a swing. And if I don't go first with these guys, I think they'll just die. Going first with their Hellblade attacks. Now because I charged, their Unstoppable Ferocity special rule gives them plus one to their strength and attacks bringing me up to strength six. This still only wounds the death tread on fives. However, it does give me the additional attack, so that part I like. I'll have 13 attacks here, hitting on threes. And only getting seven hits, now rolling to wound on five pluses. And we get one wound. Guys, three plus save goes to a six plus. And now rolling for the Juggernaut's bladed horn attacks hitting on three pluses. Because of their devastating charge special rule, I get to add two to the strength of these attacks, bringing me up to strength seven, which equals Guy's Death Dread's toughness of seven. So I'll need fours to wound here. These attacks are AP minus one, so Guy will need to make four plus to save. He saves three, only two go through. Next up, we'll have the Blood Letters attack those shoot boys and I'm going to pull the Death Dread into them. I'll land within an inch. In the event that the Death Dread takes out the Blood Crushers, he'll still be engaged with the Blood Letters, and he won't be able to move freely. With 17 attacks on the charge, due to their Unstoppable Ferocity special rule, giving them an extra attack and plus one more strength, I'll have 17 hits on three pluses. That's a good amount of hits. Now wounding on threes, because of their plus one strength. Getting eight wounds. Guy gets to make his six plus invulnerable save due to his Death Skulls rule. Guy makes one of them, and seven of those t-shirt saves are taken out. Well, that was pretty nasty. Well, I've got three boys still in the fight though, so let's pile them in and see if they can do any damage back to the Blood Letters. Now these shooter boys just get two attacks each, hitting on threes, and they'll be wounding on threes too. I managed to score five wounds. Let's see if Dave can save them on a 5+. plus. So just one save made, which means Dave's Bloodletter squad is now down to just four models. And now I get to fight back with my Death Dread. Now, it would be tempting to get rid of that little squad of Bloodletters, but to be honest, I think I'm gonna go for the Blood Crushes. With a little bit of help from my Death Skulls reroll, hitting on threes and wounding on twos, everything goes through. And Dave is reduced to his 5 plus demonic save. Ah. <sighs> He saves three of them, so that means one of them still survives. Now rolling for morale, starting with the Blood Crushers. Because that demonic icon is still alive, if I roll a one here, another Blood Crusher gets to come back. And wouldn't you know it, oh, we get one back. And I think that Blood Hunter is thirsty for more blood. Rolling morale for the Blood Letters. Unfortunately, roll a five. So we fail our morale, one automatically flees, and now we have to roll for the rest of them. On any ones or twos, they flee. And the rest are fine, they stay. Okay, now I need to do a morale test on my boys. They lost seven models, so basically anything I roll is a fail. And I roll a six, great. So one of them's definitely gone. Now doing an attrition test for the remaining two, on a one or a two, they go as well. Phew, two boys left. Orcs turn two, and I go from three to four command points in the command phase. Also, I get to score one of the primaries because I hold the objective in my deployment zone with my pain boy. Five primary objective points this turn. Going on to the movement phase, I advance my war boss and my boys up as far as they could, rolling pretty well to get as close as possible to that blood throne. Still hoping to score the cut off the head secondary objective. 
And now I'm going to spend three of my command points with the stratagem Unstoppable Green Tide, which basically lets me remove a squad of boys who's less than half strength and redeploy them somewhere on the board six inches from a table edge, but no closer than nine inches to any enemy model. And the boys are back. Start the shooting phase, and I'm going to be using the Scorcher against the Bloodletters. The Death Tread can shoot even though he's currently engaged in combat because he is a vehicle, so he can use weapons in close combat. Four automatic hits, and let's see how many wounds. Oh, just one. Death Skull's reroll, still just one. Pretty pathetic. Let's see if Dave can save that on a 5+. Plus. Well, it still went through. Dave chooses to take away the banner, sacrificing his ability to hopefully generate some more bloodletters to stay locked in combat so I can't target him with any other shooting. My war boss and my boys are going to be targeting the blood throne. Four shots coming in, hitting on sixes. Death Skull's reroll, nothing at all. Time for the boys. 18 shooter shots coming in from the boys and three from a big shooter, hitting on fives one single shot from the big shooter actually causing a wound, even after all rerolls. Unbelievable. And of course Dave saves it. Why wouldn't he? And while I'd love to shoot with my knobs, wink, they advanced and they have pistols, so no go. Shooting phase behind us, onto the charge phase. And I'm gonna target the blood throne with my boys, my knobs, and the war boss. Ah, needing a nine to charge. Unfortunately I rolled an eight but I'm gonna use the orc skill, here we go, to reroll, and I made it with a nine. So those boys are fighting the blood throne. Now let's see if my war boss can join in, needing a roll of 10. Nope, here we go, nope again. Oh well, next time war boss. What about the knobs? And on a charge roll of a nine, my knobs make it. That blood throne is gonna get it. And because I've got a sneaky suspicion that Dave's going to try and interrupt this fight phase, I'm going to choose to fight with the knobs first. The knobs have three attacks each, hitting on threes. Strength seven with the big choppers against toughness seven of the blood thrown, wounding on fours. Ah, sad demon noises. Dave managed to make four of those five plus invulnerable saves, but with two damage each from the big choppers, that means the blood throne is dead, unless he uses one command point to reroll one of those saves. And he does, but it still fails. So that blood throne is dead. He gone. He gone, he gone buddy. buddy. With that fight over, I'm gonna consolidate my knobs towards the blood crushers. Now that guy's charging units have gone, I'll go with my blood crushers and attack that death dread. I don't get any bonuses for charging this time. For a total of seven attacks with their hellblades, I'll hit on threes. Getting six hits and with five pluses to wound, I'll land two of them. Minus three AP on these. So that's me on a six plus save? Nope. And now it's time to attack with the juggernaut's bladed horns. Six attacks here, hitting on threes again and wounding on fives, landing two more wounds. Yes, one damage each. Whoa, wow. You're down to one wound? So even though it would tactically probably make more sense to attack the Blood Crushers because they're the bigger threat, the Blood Letters are still gonna get to fight next. So my Death Dread is gonna be targeting the Little Blood Letters. Five attacks, hitting on threes and wounding on twos. After all the Death Skulls rerolls, three of those wounds go through and only one of those demonic five plus saves gets made. But those two little Blood Letters gone, that marks the end of Orc's turn two. Uh, can Dave turn this around with just two blood crushes left? Unfortunately, because it's Dave's turn, I actually get to go first in the fight phase. So here come five attacks from my Death Dread on the blood crushes. And that is five attacks hit, and with a little Death Skulls magic, five attacks wound. I gotta make some five plus invulnerable saves here. Ugh! Both of the blood crushers die! Shit. <laughs> And with the blood crushes gone and me already ahead on points, that means there is unfortunately no way for Dave to turn this around and the orcs are victorious. Orcs versus corn on a small table. I knew this was gonna be pretty fast and furious. And what a result, tabling in turn two. The corn demons are knocked out of the tournament and the orcs progress to the next stage. Well, that was certainly unexpected. At the end of the first turn there, 
I thought Korn was going to win. I thought it was lucky that the Death Dread survived. It was unfortunate that the Blood Throne failed the charge. I think had that happened, it would be a very different game. But I still believe in the list. I think that if we were to play a second game, the outcome would be different. Well, thanks for having me on the channel. Uh, I certainly wasn't uh, what I was expecting, nor the outcome I desired. However, it was fun. Ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what I care about most. And skulls were sacrificed to corn. Thanks to Penny for rolling those dice. I felt like there was a sinking there, and there was a mutual feeling of wanting the dice to be successful. At different points, I felt like it was me and Penny versus Guy. It was, Dave. <laughs> By the way, all the guest players in this tournament will receive an appearance fee to thank them for their time, but Dave chose to donate his to a charity of my choice. What a bloody lovely bloke. I chose to support the mental health charity Calm, the campaign against living miserably. Speaking of money, Midwinter Minis episodes are made possible by our awesome community of supporters on Patreon, so here's a quick shout out to our newest members. Bartwomio Kolenko, Torben Jensen, Samuel Barisic, Zoltan Fischer, Oliver, Jack Wells, Marco Heinrich, Chris O'Brien, Anne Baceres Morgan, Elliot Rees, James's Hobby Desk, Jan Paces, Steel Angel John, Ula, Graveyard Duck, Nico Mancer, Joseph McMullen, Pewty DMD, and Bethany Lundy. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this opening game. If you've got any suggestions for how to improve future episodes, please let me know in the comments. Please like the video to help other people find it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.